Well, uh, and I'll turn the lights low when we get started. Now you, you've met our speaker already. <laughs> Laura Jean Checky. <laughs> I get tickled here in the name. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's good. <laughs> and uh, there's a long list of, of activities, but she's uh, very busy. <laughs> very busy. Uh, so Research Consortium. Uh, she is a volunteer at American Museum of Natural History and a lecturer at Hayden Planetarium. And, and, and it's a long list, but I know that you're just really eager to stop talking. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is move Always. out of the way. The topic is astrobiology: the search for life. Right. And uh, please welcome. <coughs> okay. So thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for coming. Um, uh, before I begin, uh, yes, he did say that I work with NASA, and I do. I am a volunteer for them. I've been there for uh, since 2003. However, this is not a NASA lecture. So what I say here, I just want to um, uh, make sure that it's understood that what I'm saying here is not um, anything that NASA is putting forth. Okay, you may see some things that are, of course, you know, you see up here. Um, rovers and orbiters that are a part of NASA, but this is not a NASA lecture. Okay, some of my next lectures are specifically NASA, this one is not. But this one is the search for life, astrobiology. How many of you believe that life exists in the universe? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a lot of you. Okay, now here comes the big question. How many of you think it's visiting us? Okay, we got one, two, three, okay, great. Okay, that's interesting. So the rest of you do not believe it's visiting us, but you believe it's out there somewhere. Is that, can, is that fair to say? Okay, well, uh, how many of you have heard of astrobiology? A few of you. Okay, a lot of people have not, especially students. So I really like it when there's students in the audience because um, it is a field that is growing uh, rapidly especially with Curiosity, which, who is not right now searching for life, but searching for a habitable environment that it did in fact find. But it is a field that is really up and coming. So what is astrobiology? Right here, I'll read the slide. Don't you love when lecturers do that? Astrobiology is devoted to the scientific study of life in the universe, origin, evolution, distribution, and future. So what does it mean? It means we are searching for life among the stars astrobiology, right? This is a simple explanation. So who are the astrobiologists? I love this, okay? We have here, this is Tullus Onstott down at Princeton. He is a geophysics professor finding all kinds of microorganisms. And as an astrobiologist, he was actually voted uh, People Magazine's top 100 most influential people. So you see, scientists rock these days, right? <laughs> Back in my day, it was like Jacques Cousteau. And whoever was doing Wild America or some wild America or something like that. I can't remember who it was, but whoever that was, you know. Um, who was it? Marlon Perkins. Okay, yeah. And I remember it was always like mutual Omar or some kind of uh, commercial. So we have Tulsa Ansaj, you okay? And then we have people who are actually um, in the drilling industry. Okay, so maybe not scientists, but you're looking at some engineers. Chemists, marine biologists, right? You have regular biologists. M mammalian biologists, this is my favorite one. These are astrophysicists. This is what the astrophysicists do. You see, they stand behind the poster of the stars, right? Isn't this yeah. great? It's such a great representation. Because here you have everybody who's really engaged in some kind of scientific research, and then you have the astrophysicists. You know? So the astrophysicists are there as well. Geologists, a lot of geologists in astrobiology. This woman here is Margaret Race. She is a marine biologist, and she is also the person who makes sure, or makes certain, that what we send to another planet is not contaminated, right? So it used to be that we were nervous that we would bring things back and contaminate Earth. Now we're nervous that we're gonna send something out and contaminate the other planet, right? Because we're searching for life. We don't wanna bring life to the planet. We wanna, we wanna see it as it is without any of our influence. All right, then we have um, this woman right here who um, actually is the woman who, whoop, I don't want to step out of the zone, is the woman who uh, contact, the, the, the person in contact, what was her name? Jody Foster. Jody Foster, right. She actually portrays her, and for some reason, I don't know why her name is escaping me right now. Does anybody know who she is? No? 
Who? Not the one from Jungle Bank. That's no, 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 no. She works at Fetty. No, no, no. She works at Fetty. And then we have David Morrison over here who told me that he coined the phrase astrobiology. Yeah. He told me that a few years ago. So I'm not sure if that's, I don't, I'm not sure if that's correct. But, but he told me that he came up with that. So what is life? What are we looking for? What is everybody looking for? I see you there. I see you there with that. You better watch yourself. I'm a teacher. <laughs> you can look it up. You can look her name up. Um, I had a study, yeah. So uh, we don't know what life is. Okay, we don't know what life is. Does that, confu does, does that seem reasonable to you? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. There's only one example so far. Anybody know where that example is? Here. Exactly, right? So the idea, uh, we know that all life shares common processes, right? Pretty much so, for the most part. We know that we seem to be evolved from a common ancestor. I am not going to go into that with the audience today, okay? So I'm just, I just put we seem to be, okay? So I'm leaving it open for interpretation here, okay? Um, and the challenge when we look out there is to try to look out there without an earth bias. Very difficult, very, very difficult. So what is life? Uh, when you're in high school, how many of you are in high school? You're in high school? You're in high school? Okay, you've learned about what life means have you learned about that yet what the conditions for life are have you learned all right so we know that there's intelligent life anybody know who this is yes okay good at least we remember that name right and there's simple life like algae right so we know the kinds of life that we have here on earth we have the standard criteria has to have homeostasis has to be able to Jill Tarter is that what you mouth her name is Jill Tarter thank you very much yeah um, homeostasis, um, so you have to be able to control your, temp your internal temp temperature, right? So if you go to 104, what happens? Fevers. Seizures. Seizures. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah. I, I actually had 104. I don't think I had seizures, but... Okay, you have to have cells. Um, you have to be able to metabolize, right? Change energy. Uh, have some kind of energy input and then metabolize it. All right? And you have to have autonomous motion. Right, this is what we're, t we're teaching in high school. Does this sound familiar to everyone? Do you guys remember this when you were in school? No. The adults are like, I don't remember this. I don't remember learning about this. This is what, I mean, I was taught this. You have to grow. You have to um, be able to mutate and adapt. Is this sounding a little bit more familiar? You have to uh, respond to stimuli. I love this. Kids never know what stimuli is, and so I'll say, it's something outside, and then I'll go like this to them, and they're like, what are you, what are you crazy? And it's like, yeah, it's, that's stimuli. Something, when I poke you, you're going to... You're going to move, okay? Something outside of yourself. And of course, you have to reproduce. This is the standard definition. This is what we use. So using that definition now, so audience participation, what do you think about these three things up here? Do you think they're alive or not alive? Hmm. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is a fire. I'm not talking about the two critters down here. This is obviously a hurricane. And this is a mule. So a show of hands. How many of you think the hurricane is alive? Okay, one, it has a cell, right? Does it reproduce? Does it grow? Does it metabolize? Does it have energy? Does it pick up more energy as it goes along? It has autonomous motion. Fits a lot of the criteria, right? How about the fire? Yeah. Huh? Oh, the fire seems like it could be alive, right? You ever see a fire... I love this. Somebody asked me once um, if I could help uh, recommend uh, to the mayor of a, a town down the shore, I won't say it, uh, which town it was, to put a sprinkler system in the Pine Barrens. And I said, sprinkler system in the Pine Barrens. Why would you want to put a sprinkler system in the Pine Barrens? Well, because we don't want the, the pines to catch fire anymore. I said, so you want to you kill the Pine Barrens, right? Because the, the cones only open with fire. Right? So if you, if you put a sprinkler system and you kill the pine barrens. And they said, well, we don't like it when it goes from here and it hops across the road, right? The fire actually jumps across the road. And in one sense, it's reproducing, right? It grow, it's growing. It has now split off and it's growing. Um, what about the mule? Raise your hand if you think mule's alive. Really? But under the standard definition, you must be able to reproduce. You can clone it. You can clone it. That doesn't count. We're not talking about cloning here. Look at mad scientists over here. No. <laughs> no, we're talking about regular reproduction, okay? Um, you know, not, no in vitro, no cloning, just on its own that it can actually do that. 
So when you look at these three things, it's a little difficult to put in perspective from the traditional definition of what is life, what is really alive. So now you go to another planet and you're looking around and you're using the standard definition, it's going to be a little bit more difficult, right, if you do find something. So the working definition of life, as is used in astrobiology, um, this is Max Coleman's slide from the NASA Astrobiology Institute, is a self-organized system capable of processing energy sources to its advantage, is considered to be alive. Oh, sorry about that. I don't like when it does those things. So um, you're focusing on chemical energy. So that makes it a lot easier to, to search for life because the criteria has now been narrowed. Okay, something that can metabolize, something that is giving off chemical energy that is measurable is potentially alive. Right, so it, under that definition, you're looking here at all of these things basically being alive, right? I, I do this, uh, this little uh, icebreaker sometimes when I'm doing teacher workshops for this. And I, pu I put cards and it. One says alive, not alive, unsure. I, I didn't create that. It came from a, a NASA Astrobiology Institute. And then I put like marshmallow. I give them other cards. Marshmallow, hurricane, mule, clock. And I had a theoretical physicist tell me that the clock is alive because it reproduces time. It travels through time. So to him, that was autonomous motion. And it has wood that could have molecular movement in it. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, he really made a really good argument for it, though. And I, I said, OK, you know what? It's alive. I mean, he made such a good argument. I had to say, except that it's alive. So when we're looking for life, we're looking in what's called the Goldilocks zone. Anybody know what this planet is? Kid, child. Go ahead. Venus. Venus, right. Too hot. Right? What about this one? What about you? What, what is this? What does this look like? Mars. Mars. Too cold. Right? But Earth, just right. Right? So we call that the Goldilocks zone. Okay? So this used to be the criteria. You had to have a Goldilocks zone. Everybody was looking for the Goldilocks zone. And then... Um, we realize that you don't have to be in a Goldilocks zone. You just have to have some planetary ingredients. So you have to have water, all right? And the reason you have to have water um, is because on Earth, where there's water, there's life. So if you're going to spend money to search for life, you're going to want to narrow it down to places that have water because that's going to give you the best bang for your buck, so to speak, right? Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, yeah right? So you, you're not going to go to a dry planet because when you have a liquid, liquid can mix everything together, right? So if you have nutrients, essential elements, but you have nothing to combine them, they're just going to stay where they are and they're never going to form anything. Does that make sense? Excellent. I like when what I say makes sense because so often it doesn't. <laughs> Why not liquid and methane? Yeah, that's okay too. But for the most part, um, the, the current um, agencies are looking for water because we know on Earth where there's water, there's life. You know? So that, that would be the best use of the taxpayer dollar. But again, this is not a NASA lecture, so I don't want you to think that anything that I'm saying is, is what they're uh, putting forward. Uh, this is just common knowledge. Um, you're thinking of Titan specifically, right? right? Yes, so Titan, um, uh, Saturn's largest moon, has a the only other place in the solar system that has liquid lakes, but they're hydrocarbon lakes, methane, ethane, although there is evidence now that there is also an ocean there, or some, yeah, some um, body of salt water. So that, would, that makes it double interesting to me anyway. I know if I was on that team, you know, Europa is always the one everybody's looking at, but with the methane lakes and then the water, that, that makes it very interesting to me. So you have to have water or a liquid, something that can combine. The essential elements, chemical energy. Okay, so there has to be something to catalyze the reactions, right? So lightning or some kind of, of outgassing or geothermal energy or planetary thermal energy. And then you have to have stability. So you have to have something that's been around for a while, right? I mean, this all makes sense. You, you can't have something that's really new that's being bombarded by uh, meteorites all the time because it's just, it does, doesn't get a chance, right, to have the life actually form. So this brings us to my favorite little creatures on Earth. How many of you have heard of extremophiles? Raise your hand. Oh, you're killing me. It's not enough hands. You will be dazed and amazed when I show you these extremophiles, <coughs> especially my favorite, the water bear. It's going to make me jump up and down. How many of you have heard of a water bear? 
Really? Okay, excellent. Uh, or tardigrade or moss piglet. Let me just give you the other names just in case. Okay. Wow, a lot of you have never met the water bear. I'm so excited. I love introducing the water bear to new people. Okay. <laughs> it's a little bit of a crazy thing. So what are these superbugs? So extremophiles are very tiny little critters that can live in extreme environments, just like their name suggests. So you have thermophiles. They like heat. Okay, halophiles, salt lovers. Um, you have acidophiles, they like acid. There's, there's uh, little extremophiles that love arsenic and thrive on arsenic. Could you imagine if we were living in arsenic? I mean, it, would, you know, it always reminds me of arsenic and old lace, which probably nobody in this audience knows. You know? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's such a great movie. <laughs> the elderberry wine, right? Yes. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt going up the stairs. Um, so the superbugs are amazing, okay? And what, was, what happened was years ago, when I was in school, not that many years ago, but when I was in elementary school, the big thing was you couldn't have life unless you were a certain distance from your parent's star because what do plants need? How about you? Do you know what plants need? Do you know what they do? Dad, help her out, Dad. Starts with a P. How do they, con what do, how do they convert that energy from the sun? Photosynthesis, exactly, right? So we used to think photosynthesis was necessary for life. Right? I mean, how many of you growing up were told that? That you had to be close, right? Because photosynthesis, right? Really? Some of you weren't told that in school? Where did you go to school? Did you go in the United States? <laughs> yeah, photosynthesis was the big thing. If, you, if there was no photosynthesis occurring, then chances were there were no life. There was no life. But what happened was there were some smokers found. There was a whole community found by the Juan de Fuca Ridge, all right, in Washington, off the coast of Washington State. And um, the American Museum of Natural History went out there with, I believe, um, a university from Washington, I don't know which one, and they actually harvested these black smokers, these sulfide chimneys. And when they went down there, they couldn't get down there at first because they're so far down and the pressure um, is very high, the temperatures are very hot. So they, had, they saw the community, but they had to wait for the submersibles to be built, like Alvin, is Alvin, is that the name of the first submersible? I think it was Alvin. And then they saw there was this whole community down there in these high temperatures and with these, these noxious hydrogen sulfide gases. And there was these huge six foot tube worms. It made all kinds of international news because now there's no sunlight there. There's no photosynthesis. So we have a new definition now for life. You don't need to be close to the sun or a star that is like the sun. You can be somewhere further away. And if you are near a planet, like let's say Jupiter, that is tugging on you and there's tidal friction occurring and it's causing the interior to melt or to stay warm, you can have liquid and then you can have this community because they are thriving on what's called chemosynthesis, a brand new idea in the scientific community. And it revolutionized the way people look at the search for life because you're not limited to just that photosynthetic world. Now you have the chemosynthetic world and now you, it opens up the whole solar system and eventually the universe to to life. And what we're looking at is we're looking at these extremophiles, these little superbugs, all right? They are, uh, they don't care where they live. They don't care what the conditions are. If we run out of oxygen, what happens? We die, <laughs> right? If they run out of oxygen, they don't care. They'll just start synthesizing hydrogen, methane, whatever's available. They are so hardy. You know, I love when humans, you know, uh, say to me that we are, we are the, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest and the best and, and, and top of the food chain and everything else and nothing can destroy us. And when I think about how we can just lose oxygen but these creatures will still be here and we would be gone in you know, two years or so, it amazes me. They are so hardy. They don't care what's happening. There's a heavy bombardment. Meteorites are striking the planet. It's okay, humans, you do what you can. We're going to go underground. We're going to hibernate. And 10,000 years, we're going to come out and we're going to reanimate and you will be gone and there will be something else roaming the earth and we will still be here. You know, it's pretty amazing. This is um, a picture of those hydrogen sulfide communities. These are those six foot tube worms. Inside the tube worms are archaeobacteria, which is an ancient form of bacteria that metabolizes this, these noxious hydrogen sulfide gases. Things eat the tube worms, things eat the bacteria and the things that are released from these um, critters and a whole, there's a whole environment down there. It's a whole environment of life down there, mostly albino, which is creepy. But you know, there's no sun, so they don't need that. It's another picture. 
This is in Antarctica. All the stuff you're seeing, it's all microbes. Do you think you could just live there? No way, right? We could, but you know, we'd have to be all bundled up. You know, we, it would be difficult for us, right? So you're looking at really deep wells, deep, deep, deep underground, okay? You're looking at high acidity here. Who wants to go stick their toe in that? Nobody, right? Could you imagine you stick your toe in? Some kid said to me, what happens if I stick my toe in? I said, you could, you'll pull out your bone, right? I mean, that's basically what would happen. You, you'll still have your toe, but there won't be any skin on it. Um, this is in Yellowstone. So here you have, again, these really hot springs. This is all that sludge. And people thought there's no way life exists in these areas, right? So these, these discoveries are, um, are revelations to scientists. And now that they know they're there, they're just discovering more and more each day. So this is uh, similar to what one would look like. This is one, actually. It's a squat lobster. <laughs> it's pretty gross, right? It's kind of, but I think this one really looks like an alien. This, this I think, looks like your traditional, I'm going to pop out of your stomach and eat your brains <laughs> alien, right? <laughs> I mean, that's how I like this one so much. I mean, I don't think I would like it um, on me. You know, like the tardigrade, I could definitely grow a colony on my skin. I know that probably sounds very bizarre to some of you. But this thing, I, I would freak out if it was on me. This, this would make me do the thing with my hair, you know, like I did the other day when you, when you think there's a spider in your hair. So what does this guy do? He will um, go anywhere where there's methane. So if there's methane in a rock, he'll attach himself and he'll just suck out the methane, wherever there's methane. So it, it doesn't matter what is going on in the outside environment, oxygen levels, carbon dioxide, he doesn't care. If there's methane, he's, he's going to be fine. This is my guy. How cute. How many of you think he's cute? Raise yes. your hand. Okay, ready? Okay, now wait. Oh, look at that one. Come on, guys. Look at this. He's so gorgeous. All right, look at this one. I hate what he does. That. How could you not love this creature? All right, everybody, I insist everyone in the audience love him. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> they sell them for pets. I would have a million of them if they sold them for pets. Actually, you could find these pretty much everywhere. Everywhere. They're all over. Anywhere where there's moss. Um, where, well, I'm going to show you a little video. Actually, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he did a show called Nova Science Now. And he said to me one day, uh, you know, did you watch my show? No, I didn't watch your show. Right? Next year, did you watch the show? No, I didn't watch the show. So I finally got a DVR and I started taping his show. And there was a little clip. How many of you have seen that show, Nova Science Now? Okay, some of you, do you know like in between the segments there were little tiny clips? And there was a clip of the water bear that I went nuts over and I, I said, you have to make it public on the internet. Let me just see if I can do this here. And I want to show you the water bear before I even go into more discussion about it on this clip. Okay, the posts that come up. It takes a minute, I guess, huh? Um, and in fact, in the new show Cosmos, I only saw the first three or two. Oh, this is streaming live, isn't it? I shouldn't be admitting this. Um, but in any case, it was all it was about water bears. So he mentions the water bears, and then there's one where the water bears go are, um, are really delved into. And he says if there were aliens from another world, they would think that this was, in fact, a water bear world. So can somebody maybe help me get this up here so that we can show the video? I don't know why it's not coming up. Is okay. okay, nobody, it's nobody's coming. standing up to help me. This should be the video. Uh, he told me if I do B, it goes to the video. You were just there and you were just logged in as mm -hmm. user? Yes. Switch user? Yes. Okay. Or clicked into the camera. There you go. Oh, that just needs a second to come on in. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming you, you have had this uh, situation before because uh, some of you in the audience are actually. Click on Dell. Yeah. What does it say? Log Click on Dell? Yeah. Log Dell. Yeah. Log on there again. Okay. okay. Pre prepare yourself for something so awesome, okay? <laughs> okay, so meet the water bear. Wait, when you see this, you're gonna fall in love with them, okay? First of all, gorgeous, okay? But wait, wait, wait. Look at it, that's it right there. Look at how teeny weeny it is, it's so adorable. How could you not love this guy, right? Look at the temperatures, 
negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, there's, and as high as 257, there's not much that's going to get this guy. Okay, a lot of things can happen. Go without water and air, the astronauts threw a bag of them outside the International Space Station. And they survived out there in the radiation of space for 10 days. Right, with no air, no water. Um, and they survived. I and mean, we, we couldn't do that for, for, three, for three seconds, right? <laughs> now this is my favorite, look at this. Look at the little NASA meatball. You see that, how cute is that? They've got little, they got little space suits on. I think it's so adorable. Okay, so now that I have introduced some of you, now how many of you love the water bear? Come on, let me see it. Come on guys, let me see it. They're so cute and tiny and squishy, right? <laughs> so these guys are literally everywhere. If conditions do not suit them, they go into what's called a tun state, and they look like a little raisin, right? They just completely hibernate, and they go into this tun state. And then when conditions are right and water is available, they just reanimate like nothing ever happened. Thousands of years, right? And it's like nothing ever happened. They are amazing little creatures. And like I said, if I could grow a colony of them on me, I, I absolutely would. I know that sounds crazy, but that's how much I love them. I actually want to study them for a PhD thesis. So, so we are looking for signs of life uh, next door. Again, curiosity is not searching for life, okay? I was at um, uh, Bergen Community College also has an observatory. On Friday nights, it's free public viewing and I work that. And one of the professors was saying that, you know, it's searching for life and it didn't find life and it, that was never the directorate for this particular, um, this is Opera Spirit and Opportunity, but it was never the directorate for curiosity. It was supposed to look for a habitable environment that could have supported past microbial life and it did in fact find that. So the mission parameters were met and now it's of course moving on to Mount Sharp. This is what we were talking about before, Cassini. Okay, yeah, it's worth going to that website. Now, people ask me personally all the time if I believe in aliens, right? Are you wondering? Well, nobody's asked, so I don't have to tell you. <laughs> right, so that's awesome, okay. Um, when I tell people that the mathematical probability, this is again my opinion, the mathematical probability that some type of life out there exists is extremely high, right? So we live in the Milky Way galaxy, hundreds of billions of stars, hundreds of trillions of planets, right? This is the Hubble ultra deep field picture. Do you guys remember when this first came out? The first Hubble deep field picture? Everybody was stunned. If you took your thumb and you close one eye and you go like this to the night sky, that's about the size of the space that Hubble was focused on. It was like the size of a postage stamp. And in that, it found 10,000 galaxies. Revelation, right? People, people just didn't understand that that little piece of sky could have that. Each one of these galaxies has hundreds of billions of stars and hundreds of trillions of planets. There are now at least 100 billion galaxies that are known and have data sets for. Okay, that's a, that's a try to wrap your brain around that number, right? That, that's almost, each one has hundreds of trillions of planets, right? You can't even, as humans, we can't acknowledge a number that large, right? We can't resolve it in our brains. But we can figure out it's pretty big, right? So to think that there is no life out there is, um, I think, irresponsible to say that outwardly because we don't know. We don't know that there's life out there. But I think leaving the idea that there might be open is a good thing. Then people will say to me, well, um, I saw a UFO. And it was going 800 miles an hour. It was going this way. And then it banked and it went that way. And our aircraft doesn't do that. And I go, wow, that's amazing. Because, you know, we have um, inertia, momentum. So if it was going this way, and then it went that way, that means that all the organs of the aliens were still going 800 miles an hour that way. And the woman said to me, they don't have organs. And I said, oh, well then of course you saw it. I was like, that, that makes perfect sense that they have no internal structure, that they're just blob of something, I don't know. Even if they were just a blob, they would be splatted against you know, the, the wall 800 miles an hour that way, you know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I, I hate to break this to humans because I know humans feel very, um, you know, elitist in their own planet, but um, we are relatively space junk in our own solar system, right? Um, not humans themselves, but Earth is pretty much space junk, all right? The majority of our solar system being what? 
Jupiter and Saturn. 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 No. Sol yes. <laughs> the sun. The sun. Very good. So the sun and Jupiter, right? And Earth is, is is garbage left over, right? It's 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 wonderful garbage because it's it's where we live and it's sustaining life and it, you know it's promoting life. But um, but why would somebody want to come here from some distant, faraway planet? It just doesn't make sense when we know now that there's water pretty much throughout the universe. So many planetary objects have water on them now, right? We, we know that. Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber. <laughs> well, I don't get the reference. I hate when I don't get these references. I feel like such a nerd. Names earning respect and dignity. Nerd, <laughs> right? Names earning respect and dignity. Somebody said to me, you're a nerd because you say that. And I was like, yeah, but I think it's you know really good. Um, so I don't get the reference, but I think I know who he is. Isn't he a singer that's always arrested or something? Or is that somebody else? Yeah. Okay, I'm thinking maybe there's a Justin Timberlake. I don't know. There's I know there's a couple of Justin somethings, right? Just in time. Just in time, right? Just in time, right? Life, the clock, just in time. That's so funny. Um, yeah. So it's. Um, I think that you know, if anybody ever heard of the Drake equation, has anybody ever heard of that? The Drake equation. Yeah. So, so definitely, you know, I think that the probability for life to be out there is high. Um, Personally, and again, this is not a NASA lecture, so I'm allowed to, to say something personal. I don't believe it's visiting us. I, I would love for it to visit me, um, take me out and say, now you know every mathematical equation in the world. And when you go back to Columbia, you can, you, you can go to the professor and say, ha-ha, right? Because math was really, uh, some of those math classes blew my mind. Um, I would love it if they could infuse my brain with some kind of knowledge. But I was talking about this yesterday, and I said more likely it would be a cookbook. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? From uh, to serve man. yeah, to serve man. That was a Twilight Zone episode, right? Although um, I, I was having, we were having a discussion at the American Museum of Natural History, and uh, Neil had said that it's more likely that humans are holding a mirror up to themselves when they say that aliens would be violent, because all throughout human history, mm -hmm. whenever we have had um, superior technology, we've always dominated the less technologically superior uh, beings, right? So it's not necessarily true that they would actually come here and want to eat us or war with us, right? That's a little bit ridiculous. But if you think of our closest star other than the sun, the closest star is Proxima Centauri, right? This would take four years if we were traveling at the speed of light to get to, right? So it's about 25 trillion miles away, right? So it's four light years away and one light year being roughly six trillion. So we'll just round up. You know, when you're talking numbers that large, you just round up a little bit. At our current propulsion method, it would take us 30,000 years to get there. 30,000 years to get to the nearest star, okay? So I find it very unlikely that there is somebody coming just to visit us because we're interesting. I mean, when there's hundreds of trillions of other planets just in our galaxy, and then there's 100 billion other galaxies. I, I just think it's highly unlikely. Um, I don't know. Has anybody been visited by aliens here? Oh, that's a good sign. <laughs> Okay, that's good. Nobody raised their hand. For those in the front, no one in the back raised their hand. So, so this man, Carl Sagan, who I am so embarrassed to say I have never seen on TV. And I don't know why. I must have been in a generation that just skipped this or something. I actually remember Alan Alda for some reason. I remember him doing some kind of show about space. But I never did see Carl Sagan. But, of course, um, I, have heard, I have read The Pale Blue Dot, which is um, this nice little poem that he came up with. So... Bless you. I don't know if that's politically correct to say, but um, <laughs> so we are here, this little dot right here. Um, the Voyager 1 team at the time decided to turn the spacecraft around. This is nearly 4 billion miles away, and they looked at Earth, and of course the famous um, uh, line that you usually see is a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam, right? I don't know if any of you have seen that or heard that, but th these actually are not sunbeams. This is some kind of aberration within the, in the fo photo, okay? So w within the camera itself. These are not sunbeams, but it's romantic to say that, right? The mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Um, so we are here. When you're looking at it from 4 billion miles away, which really isn't that far away, doesn't look like much, right? But everybody you know, that's what he says, everyone you love, everyone you know, et cetera, et cetera, is on that mode of dust. So it's extremely important to us. Hello, may I help you? <laughs> All right, this one is a Cassini image, all right? Now, 
If you look here, it's, if, if it was a little darker, you'd be able to see it better, but I, maybe you can resolve it. If you look right over here, Enceladus is over here. Enceladus has um, geysers, water geysers, that are spilling out, causing this ring right here to form. Okay? You can see two moons in here. These are called shepherd moons. And what they do is they keep the rings in their position. Okay, so they shepherd those rings in the position to keep them from not falling into the other rings or falling into Saturn itself. There's another shepherd moon over there. It looks like um, the rings are on the planet because this was, Cassini was at a 15 degree angle. The sun is behind Saturn here. So that's why it's illuminated this way and it's just the shadow of the rings that are, um, look like they're uh, being cast on the planet. Well, they are being cast on the planet. This ring was also discovered in this picture. So there's two new rings that were discovered in the picture. And then there's that. Anybody want to guess what that is? <laughs> Earth, right? So you have this picture, right? And then you have, the, which was 4 billion, then you have the 800 million mile picture, right? And Earth was just caught in the background. They didn't plan this, right? And it went viral. I mean, I couldn't get it. I wanted them to make book parks. I was like, make everything you can. But, you know, we, they, don't, they don't make a lot of, of that stuff anymore because uh, of funding issues. But um, Earth is in the background there, and I think when you see it from that perspective, it really makes you think about how teeny tiny we are. I mean, it really is like Whoville, right? It's, almost, it's a little weird. You know, when I watch that show, Horton Hears a Who, I always think of that. Like, I could really be on one of those dandelion things, right? And you know, one day something could pick us up and we all have to go up to the top and like blow our horns and our thingamajingers, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to leave it open for questions now, okay? You can ask me questions about aliens if you so choose. Um, and I will try to uh, answer anything that um, I can. Does anyone have any questions? Have you heard of the wow signal and what do you think about it if it has? Um, that was actually, yeah, Jill Tarter. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know how to get this off here, so. Um, yeah, so uh, the wow signal. Um, I think that it's very interesting, right? But it wasn't able to be reproduced and we never heard it again, right? And that, you know, that's what, that's what you need. So it's, it's one of those things that you can't, you can't really definitively say anything about, right? Because it's, it's just like an anomaly. If it was repeated, if it was something that could have been pegged and pinpointed, this is what it was. But yeah, I mean, wow, it was interesting. So I don't really give too much um, um, opinion about things like that because nobody really knows what it is, right? And I don't want to conjecture and say, I think I know what it is because there's scientists that, are work that were working specifically on that, Jill Tarter being one of them, right? So. You said earlier that when you uh, narrow the definition of life down, even that hurricane fits in. Describe that a little bit better? Well, because what you're saying is anything that is giving off some kind of chemical signature could be remarkable enough for somebody to look more into. In other words, instead of saying, well, gee, we, we came up upon this thing on another planet, and it looks like it might be life because it grows and it reproduces, but we're not sure, right? Like the mule. We're not really sure. Like it always baffles kids, but I can poke it in the eye. I mean, it's breathing. Yeah, but it doesn't reproduce. So when they, when they narrow that down to just saying anything that's releasing like a chemical, that's metabolizing and releasing a chemical signature. That's the thing. It has to metabolize it and turn it into something else, right? So we breathe in oxygen and we release carbon dioxide, right? So when you're looking for life on other planets, you're looking for water vapor in the atmosphere, methane. You're looking for carbon dioxide. You're looking for oxygen, right? So if you see those signatures, then that's what you kind of hone in on. So it's not, it's not definitive saying that, well, this is what life is, right? It's just saying that instead of making this broad definition where you have to have all of these criteria met, we're going, we're going to take something that we know all life does, all right? And all life in some way, shape, or form is going to metabolize, okay? It's going to release a byproduct, all right? So if we see that chemical signature in something that we're looking at, we're going to take a closer look and then see if we can determine whether it's alive or not. Right? So it just opens it up a little bit more instead of just saying, hey, well, is this really alive or isn't it? Because we don't know because it is growing, but it's not reproducing, but it's, you know, it's not metabolizing, but it does have homeostasis. It's just that that's too big of a, cri too many criteria to meet. Right on, does that Especially for a rover. 
what about the sun? It's fusing hydrogen to helium. I wouldn't consider it life. All right, well, and that's that's fine for you not to consider it alive. And you know, but we know what the sun is. We know what a star is. You know what I mean? So by our by our definitions, um, the, the sun is 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 performing that chemical reaction, but it's not really metabolizing. That's fusion, you know. But we do know what a star is. That's something you know. We do know things that are. We know this is a computer. We know that this isn't alive because we you know we have our criteria that we meet. But when you're on another planet, it's a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit more difficult, and you just can't. You, you can't just rove around the planet and not have a focus. You have to have some kind of goal. You have to have some kind of criteria that you're going to meet that's not too broad that you have to spend $17 billion trying to get your rover, your, your robotic explorer, to be able to um, determine if all the criteria are being met. So it's really more of a way to um, focus the, um, the mission or focus the, the, um, the directorate on what we think would be the best criteria so that and what would be what would be the best criteria to put on a robotic geologer does that make sense mm -hmm. that made sense to me <laughs> so if it didn't make sense to you it definitely made sense in my head so yeah it's not you know none of these definitely all of these definitions all of these things are a work in progress you know what I mean it's all a work in progress science is a work in progress I always tell um, my students it's driving me crazy that I can't get this off here so I'll see you guys. I always tell my students that there's no absolute truth in science. Absolutely not. No absolute truth. There's only varying levels of uncertainty. And there, we can believe something today, and then a new technology will come out tomorrow, and um, something new will be discovered that will change our whole idea of what we thought we knew. Okay? And as scientists, you have to be open to that. You have to be malleable. You, you, know, you don't have to be too far out of the box. But I think that you should be always kind of one foot in and one foot out so that you're leaving everything open for, um, for you to perceive it, right? If you have a set um, ideology in your head and something new comes along, you're going to dismiss it because it doesn't fit your criteria, right? And that's, I think, very dangerous for scientists to do. I think scientists should always be open to, to everything. So if, if an alien landed on the White House lawn tomorrow, I would be ecstatic. I wouldn't say, oh my God, but I said they weren't visiting us. I would say, wow, this is awesome. Like they finally decided to show up. Right? And it's, right? You know? No, no, that's the human mirror. That's the human mirror. You know? It's a good book. But, you know, um, you know, so you have to be, I think that you really need to be open to that. You need to be open to the idea of there's a lot that you don't know. We know, we do know uh, a lot, okay, but there's so much that we don't know that you just need to be open to it. So again, all of these definitions are a work in progress. They're just trying to make it so that make these definitions um, applicable to our technology today and, and um, the budget constraints, really. Right? So you, you, you want to be able to move forward in a way that's effective when you're spending money on things that are going to other planets. And you mentioned about propulsion systems. Uh, is there any work going on in trying to kind of explore alternate ways of, I think, uh, moving faster in space? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on that, but, you know, I'm reading the same articles probably most of you are regarding that. And I know that they're trying to come up with, like, ion propulsion right. systems and all of this, yeah. Um, I, I have no participation in any anything regarding that, but I do know certainly that, there, you know, there's funding for that. I mean, you could just go in the NSF and see, you know, what's being funded and so forth. But that would be great, wouldn't it, you know? When somebody told me yesterday that, um, I never heard of this, I mean, maybe you guys have heard of this, but that we're going to be uh, shot underground like a bank tube. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever heard of this? <laughs> You've heard of this? Yeah. This is something new to me. I just heard this yesterday. Because I was talking to a young child their age, and I said, uh, do you want to go to space? And one child said, yes, I want to go to Mars. And I'm like, yeah, the Mars generation, right? This is the Mars generation that you're looking at right here. And um, the one child said, no, I don't want to go to space. And I said, well, you're, pro you know, you're going to probably be in space anyway, at least suborbital flight, right, with all of the private um, uh, commercial space airlines coming up, right? And I said, you know, you're going to pop up, you're going to go to your, you pop down at your destination. And uh, some adult came to me and said, oh, yeah, but before that, we're going to be shot in tubes under the ground like a bank, like a bank shoots their tubes. <laughs> and I thought, well, 
I actually, so I, I didn't hear of that, so I didn't want to speak too much to it because I don't know <laughs> about it. But I said, I'm pretty sure the other thing is going to happen first. I said, because that's already in play, right? So with Virgin Galactic, we know we have um, already the spaceport, the FAA. Um, uh, a few years ago, I was at a Challenger Center conference, and a man from the FAA was there, and he said that I think something like 24 other cities have applied for a uh, permit to build a spaceport. And I just heard on the news recently that Europe is now building their own space plane. So I'm pretty sure that is going to take off before we're shot in bank tubes. Um, I don't know. Uh, don't quote me on that. Okay? I, know, I don't want to be shot in a bank tube under the ground. Bank tubes are on the table in the California high-speed rail discussion. It's yeah. just something written on the board that they talk about. That's yeah, well, somehow it's made its way into, you know, <laughs> the common uh, uh, conversation. I don't know. I haven't heard it. Well, now I've heard of it, right? But, I mean, just to, the idea of thinking of, you know, of somebody opening up the little latch and then putting me in and then kind of hearing it snap and then shooting it. <laughs> you know, as I go to California, it's a little ridiculous. On the, um, the Neil deGrasse Tyson cosmos, he had an episode about uh, basically life um, stowing away on uh, meteors from planet to planet, or mm -hmm. even from solar system to solar system. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I did not see, I know, yeah, you said and I, I, I'm so. really upset that I'm admitting this because I'm pretty sure I told him I saw them all. So I'm hoping he doesn't watch this, right? <laughs> um, I happen to know Neil deGrasse Tyson personally. I, I'm with him uh, every a few times a month. Um, so uh, it, there's a good chance he will see it, and then I'll have to hear about this that I said in public that I didn't want. But I have them all taped, you know? But it's just so many that every time I, I go to look at it, I'm like, oh, that's so many. I'm just going to watch uh, Jimmy Fallon, you know, because there's like two of them. <laughs> and, and that's what I've been doing. I'm very embarrassed, and now I'm really getting myself into it, aren't I? By like, I just keep going, right, and putting my foot deeper and deeper. Um, but, you know, there's no evidence, of course, right now that that has happened. But when you look at things like I showed you here, these, these tardigrades, for instance, that can put themselves into a state like that, and you see that in these nebula, there's all uh, um, types of um, you know, uh, different essential elements. Some have amino acids in them, right? Um, glycine, things of this nature. Um, I would say that, for me personally, I think that it, there, there's a stronger probability that it could happen than that it couldn't. How's that for a good diplomatic answer? <laughs> right? That's non-committal. But I think, you know, but again, until I see the actual evidence of that occurring, you know, I can't say definitively, yes, I believe it. But do I think that that's a possibility? I mean, I find myself open to that personally. What did he say about it? So, uh, I actually watched the episode twice, and I still didn't understand whether <laughs> he was saying that this actually exists or this is a, you know, a pie in the sky type of um, well, I can tell you it doesn't, it doesn't actually exist. I mean, right, life, have, yeah, life has not been right, found right. on anything yet. It was even talking about um, a meteorite uh, hitting Earth, coming out in space, and basically the meteorite sterilizing everything on the planet that mm -hmm. came degree of what? The debris. The debris. Right, well, Light sure. I mean, it, yeah, if there's something in the debris, it, it could rain down. I mean, it's a plausible scenario. So it is... Um, Hypothesis at this point. There's no. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, yeah, it's all conjecture at this point. You know, panspermia is is one way people think that life may have been uh, seeded on Earth. Okay, so that's you know, life. Is that what they said? Does that sound familiar? Was that in the show? So, see, I could do cosmos. Come on. <laughs> no, oh my God. I'm really. What am I doing? <laughs> so yeah, panspermia is one of the of the hypotheses of how life may have formed here. Right? Is that it actually uh, on one of the during the heavy bombardment period or shortly thereafter that life actually was carried in on a comet or a meteorite? Right. So that that is something that is um, out there and has been out there for a long time. But again. There's no solid evidence to back it up. But that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And it certainly is plausible, especially when in light of these extremophiles that we're finding on Earth. I mean, if these critters are, you know, hanging out on a, on a meteorite, a meteor in space, or meteoroid, wherever, I don't know where, where your meteor is in position. Is it orbiting the sun coming through or landed? So we'll just say all three. Um, and it's in a ton state, a hibernation state. And it stays high, but you know, the tardigrades were outside of the International Space Station for 10 days and they were fine, you know. Uh, not all of them survived, but enough of them survived to say, yeah, they can survive the radiation of space. But you're always going to have extraneous variables that you can't account for, 
right? Maybe, maybe one was a little frail or one was too young, one was too old, you know, just like on earth, if you get the flu, you know, same situation. Um, so I, I personally think that that is um, a plausible scenario. Um, I was told that at, in school by a teacher that the uh, radio waves that we send out every day from Earth could theoretically be heard by life forms on other planets. How true do you think that could be? Well, that is true. That is true that they wash out. However, I heard, okay, uh, about two years ago, that at some point, and I don't know that point because it kind of went in, it was a discussion at a table with scientists and I, it went in and out, that at some point they do decay which is something that we didn't think. We thought kind of those first broadcasts would just go out forever and ever and ever and just wash over the universe. But at some point they do decay. But certainly it's washing over enough area, okay, in, in all directions, that um, the signals are reaching at least some of the, the, um, the planetary bodies that are outside of our solar system. So it's interesting, right? <laughs> when I think of some of the things on TV, I don't know. I, I've been trying to watch um, things that are more popular culture, so I get these things. Like I didn't get the Justin Bieber reference, and I'm, oh, why didn't I get that? Because I've been trying to watch these things, but some of the things on TV are just really, like I was watching something called Naked and Afraid or something. I, didn't, I was like, what is happening? What is happening? Why are they doing this? Why are they, why are they on TV like this, you know? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, it's just, I just, I just don't kind of get it, but I've been really trying to, so that I understand the references from the audience. Actually, Neil told me I should do that because I didn't understand the, what was happening with some uh, zombie apocalypse that kids were asking me about. Yeah, because in 2000 and, uh, let's see, December 21st, uh, 2000 and, what was that, 2012? The end of the world was supposed to happen. I created a brochure because so many children were saying, you know, that global warming was going to happen that day. Aliens were going to land that day. All the same day, the sun was going to explode and um, it, 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 volcanoes were going to erupt. It was unreal. So I created this brochure that I put on my website. And you'll, you'll actually help me with it. And then I'm giving the lecture. I was giving lectures to schools about this, how it's not going to happen. And then some kid says to me, well, what about the zombie apocalypse? It's like, what is this now? I just got done giving this whole lecture about everything else that's supposed to happen. Now there's zombies that are going to come and eat your brains? I'm like, you know what? Yeah, that one's going to happen. They're all going to come and eat your brains, right? So, no, it's not true. That's not true. Right? There's, there's no evidence that there's anything that can turn anyone into a zombie. You know, there's some kind of poison that is used by certain, I guess, um, religions in, in other parts of the world that mimic that, give, do a sort of paralysis to the body, but there's not uh, something that can eat your your brain. So don't worry about that. Any children in the audience? <laughs> All right, no, no more questions about zombies. Have you heard about Red Mars, Blue Mars, Green Mars, the books? Oh, no, I have not. What, what is this? Red, Green Mars? Red, Mars, Green Mars, and Blue Mars. Uh, no, I, has anybody else heard of these books? Red Mars, Green Mars, and Blue Mars. What, what are they about? Astrobiology. Oh, what? Really? Oh my goodness! I think it's Great. Some fantasy. A bit oh, it's a fan of fiction, fantasy. Yeah. So the title it sounds like Mars going through different. Yeah, phases, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Spectral analysis, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I have not, but I'll certainly look that up. Yeah, because I, I want to be, you know, I want to be mainstream. You know, I, I'm going to ask you later about that comment because I, it's going to drive me crazy that it went over my head, right? So, any other questions before we wrap it up?